Hello, everybody. Is this on? It's, it's not on? And now it is? Greetings. I know many of you have been here for a while, and uh, I thank you for coming. Um, we're going to get started. Louder? Oh, is it working? Closer. Oh, like that. Okay. I'm not so used to this. Okay. okay. Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Susan Levine. I'm the director of the Institute for the Humanities here at UIC. And um, we're very happy to have you all here for the Stanley Fish Lecture this year, um, sponsored by the Institute and the UIC College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. Um, and we're very pleased to have our guest um, this year, Slavo Žižek, who's uh, coming from Slovenia by way of New York. And we're very happy to have you. And we're also very happy to have uh, Stanley Fish and Jane Tompkins back here at UIC. Welcome as well. <laughs> the Stanley Fish Lecture is one of the signature events of the Institute. It happens every other year um, uh, and is one of the many uh, public programs that we sponsor. Um, in addition to the lectures by our faculty, we have a number of uh, other um, lectures, working groups, um, seminars, and conferences. And you can find all of the schedule uh, on our website, or uh, you can pick up a brochure as you leave. But we have a pretty uh, wide array of uh, humanities topics, uh, ranging from the Forum for research on law, politics, and the humanities to the Chicago Area Food Studies Working Group and many more in between. Um, and I also would like to invite you to contribute to our efforts, both by coming to our events and, if you wish, by picking up an envelope outside and making a contribution to um, the work of the Humanities Institute. We have a unit to play um, in, uh, at UIC as a public urban university, and um, we cherish the humanities in that realm. Um, so this afternoon, um, Astrida Tantillo, the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, is going to say a few words about the Stanley Fish Lecture. And then Walter Ben Michaels from the UIC English Department is going to introduce our speaker, Slavo Žižek. Immediately after the lecture, you are all invited to a reception at the Institute for the Humanities. It's in the basement of Stevenson Hall, and if you don't know where that is, we have maps outside for you as well. So um, welcome to all, and um, we're looking forward to a very lively discussion this afternoon. So welcome and good afternoon. The Stanley Fish Lecture is designed to acknowledge the achievements of Stanley Fish, who was our dean here in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences between 1999 and 2004. It was initiated by the uh, then Dean Chris Comer in 2005. The lecture series has had a, a history of prominent scholars. The inaugural lecture was delivered in 2005 by Frederick Jameson, the William A. Lane Professor of Comparative Literature and Romance Languages at Duke University, who spoke on how to fulfill a wish. In 2007, the Stanley Fish Lecture was given by Stephen Greenblatt, University Professor of the Humanities, Harvard University, on Shakespeare and the Limits of Hatred. Most recently, Judith Butler, Maxine Elliott Professor, University of California, Berkeley, presented on the Frames of War. The Stanley Fish Lecture has been sponsored by my college and the Institute of the Humanities, along with a generous contribution in 2007 by the president of the New Century Bank, Faye Pantazelos. Other generous contributors have also supported previous lectures, and we are quite grateful to them. We are probably all very well acquainted with Stanley's stature as a scholar and public intellectual. I would like to say a few words about Stanley's accomplishments during his years as dean here. When he came to UIC, it was with a mandate to put us on the map. His arrival and time here were well documented from the Chronicle of Higher Education to the New Yorker. It was an extremely exciting time. Suddenly, people were talking about UIC, and they were talking about it because Stanley was here and he had big plans for us. 
He received especially a lot of press for the academic stars that he brought to our campus, and many of these individuals are still here and contributing to the excellence of this urban, diverse, and very high energy campus. What is perhaps not as well known about his years here, here is it, that it was not just about the big names that he uh, brought out here to build our reputation, it was the high number of junior scholars that he hired. By the time he had stepped down as dean, he had hired a third of our faculty. The College of Liberal Arts and Sciences is still very much the house that Stanley built. I've had opportunities to think about his legacy in terms of creating a faculty because this university, as many others, has had years of budget cuts and we have suffered significant faculty losses. The excellence of Stanley's hires, though, has continued to make itself known. Our faculty are bringing in substantially more grants and winning many war more awards than ever before, despite our smaller numbers. I worked with Stanley while he was dean here, and whenever I would meet colleagues, they would ask me, what is it like to work with him? He was a great mentor as an administrator because he always saw the big picture of why we were here. He always ridiculed senseless bureaucracy and tried to fight it in every way. And most importantly, he conveyed a message that is all too rare in academe. It did not matter what a person's perspective, political, social, or theoretical leanings were. He hired people on one criterion only, whether they were smart. I have never met anyone as intellectually open as Stanley. He loved a good argument and wanted to hire in a way that ensured one. It is such a pleasure to welcome Stanley and Jane back to campus, and I'm sure we will have a very enjoyable afternoon. So I'm going to be quick, but I just have to say one thing. I mean, I've, I've known Stanley for a, a very long time, um, and he's one of my, you know, two or three closest friends in the world, but Estrita made him sound a lot nicer than he actually is. <laughs> and uh, a lot, and she made the sort of debate thing sound a little bit anodyne. Like it's, and I want to say it's not really like that. Um, in fact, it's not like that in such a way that you feel a little trepidation introducing um, Slavoj Žižek to give the Stanley Fish lecture. It's like taking one very sort of combustible like substance and then putting it into some other like even more horribly combustible substance. <laughs> and you think on the one hand like you totally want to see what happens. <laughs> but on the other, you know, you're not sure you, like the guys in back, you could be totally happy because you're not sure you want to be around when the explosion takes place. Um, one has, one might say, both the impulse to get closer and the impulse to get farther away a contradictory desire that is, of course, central to Zizek's own Lacanianism, although a relevant difference between, say, the Objet Petita and Slavoj Zizek's Stanley Fish lecture would be that one of them is forever unattainable, whereas the other we're about to hear. It will not be, however, or not anyway not only be, as one of the foremost interpreters of Lacan, that uh, Slavoj Zizek speaks to us today. For as he has shown an extraordinary number of books, and I'm just going to name four or five out of the, actually, the list is so long, you kind of get bored reading it. You know, you just can't keep on going down. It's like a, it's like a Whitman catalog of a certain kind. But, and I'm just hitting some high points. The sublime object of ideology through the ticklish subject to in defense of lost causes and living in the end times. He is not just a brilliant interpreter of Lacan, but also a brilliant reader of Hegel, Marx, and in fact, in one of my absolute personal favorites, which I completely recommend to you, um, his book, Opera's Second Death, not only of Wagner, but even of Puccini. Furthermore, and perhaps most relevant to today's lecture, he has become a central figure in the effort to think through the meaning of the ongoing crisis in capitalism that is currently finding expression in phenomena like Occupy Wall Street and the Tea Party, or more locally, in the renewed desire to form unions and the renewed desire to keep unions from being formed. In this context, a crucial element of Zizek's importance and a crucial contributor to the, controversial, the controversies his work has provoked has been his effort to put class at the center of analysis. The controversy is both on the right, where the only acceptable use in the US of the term class is as an adjective modifying warfare and re referring disapprovingly to poor people's collective desire to stop being so poor, and also on the academic left, whereas it's chaperoned by race, gender, and sexuality, class tends to be an object of some suspicion, which is presumably why, as a colleague pointed out to me in a discussion the other day, Ernesto Laclau has remarked that 
Zizek uses class as a sort of deus ex machina to play the role of the good guy against the multicultural devils. You know, and Laclaus says that like it's a bad thing. Um, but whatever your position on these issues, if you've been paying any attention at all, that position has been influenced and your thinking has been sharpened by Zizek's work. I know you all look forward, as I do, to his lecture, Freedom in the Clouds, what is possible and impos what is impossible today, and I hope you will join me in welcoming him, welcoming him to UIC. Thanks very much. I'm really glad to be here. My gratitude to all of you here who helped to introduce me, and I noticed that there were three before. I, I consider it beneath dignity if only one guy introduced me. There must be a guy introducing a guy introducing. No, but seriously, I'm especially glad to be here because of uh, uh, because of you, Stanley, because you know how I intellectually fell in love with you. Didn't you write a book years ago? I think it was a book or a text, something like why there ain't such a thing like freedom of the speech and why it's good that there ain't. How can, you know, uh, like it, this is rare today. Even a guy that most of us definitely doesn't like, like, uh, uh, George Bush, the younger, the president. But my God, when he did that wonderful slip of tongue, you remember, I think I was misunderestimated. <laughs> How cannot you love him for a brief <laughs> second? The second more serious reason that I really like Stanley is, wasn't it you gave an interview and you were asked when you were involved in all those polemics, affirmative action and so on, but what are you? And you said, much more modestly, I'm a Milton scholar, Miltonist or what, no? Listen, this is what we should stick to today. Don't be blackmailed by this idea which may appear a leftist idea, but it's really the speech of those in power today that if you are doing just abstract humanities, whatever studies, they like to make you feel guilty, like, you know, like, you know, all this disgustingly manipulative line of thought, like, you can just study Milton on whoever here, while, and then you have a list, while children are starving in Somalia or whatever. <laughs> no, this, you know what, this is an obscenity which shows all that is false in this charity capitalism. You know, because I remember when I was young, it's true, leftists were saying, you live in an ivory tower while people are starving. But it gave me an idea that something is wrong with this when I remember some, uh, a couple of years ago, Bill Gates started to talk like that. What does it mean, all the Microsoft programs when people are dying of illnesses? And then I got it, what it really means when he went on. So let's forget our ideological boring struggles, capitalism, socialism. Let's just all get together and do something. In other words, you see, unfortunately, the children, starving children of Somalia, not to help them, but the order is give the stupid $10 to help them and stop thinking. And a, a true leftist doesn't, although, sorry, I don't mean it personally, that I'm not stigma, but it's not like that. I hope, Stanley, that at least we agree on one thing. The Marx that maybe we both like is, you know which one? In 1870 or 71, okay, it wasn't really the possibility of a revolution, but like it appeared to some guys, maybe there will be a revolution. And then there is a unique letter from Marx to Engels, which expresses Marx's deep worry, like what are these, these guys doing? They want revolution now? I haven't yet finished Capital, you know? What are they? I mean, that's the attitude. And all great guys are doing this. The world was in turmoil, 1914. What did Lenin do? He went to Switzerland and started reading Hegel's logic and so on. I mean, don't, don't, uh, don't, don't, uh, don't concede to this cheap blackmail, which is really a new form to prohibit thinking. If you play this game of how can you sp spend money here when, well, I mean, no, you, this is the new language of power today.
So this is why I really feel here solidarity with you. And for another reason I feel solidarity, because even when, take this as a friendly gesture, even when maybe, if ever I take power, and if you are still alive, <laughs> maybe you will have to take a special one-way train to Siberia, whatever you call it. No? <laughs> but still, w w where you are at the best is, you know, today, we don't need this well well-meaning liberals who always like uh, uh, paint to you some light at the end of the tunnel, things better. What is most needed today is just an honest description of a deadlock that we are in. As already the old Frankfurt School guy Max Horkheimer said once, and Adorno repeated it, pessimism in theory, optimism in practice. We don't need optimism in theory, trip one. This is why, to provoke you, uh, when somebody asked me recently, okay, what is good, what is bad in Hollywood today? I told him what I really hate is this feel good, so God Hollywood, so called Hollywood Marxism, you know, like Pelican's brief, all the president's men. It may appear very critical. My God, the president himself was corrupted together with some big company. But why do these films make us feel so good? Because you know, the ultimate message is so comfortable. My God, what a great country we live in where two ordinary guys can overthrow the mightiest man in the universe. And my provocation was, I'm sorry to tell you, I prefer 24 to this cheap liberalism. <laughs> I'm talking very seriously about the last season. I didn't see it all, I don't have time, but <laughs> the end. You remember what happened there? Jack Bauer is no longer this kind of a Himmler-style guy who is, you know, this right-wing hero where the idea is, as Himmler put it, everyone can be a hero in the sense of doing good things for his nation. A true hero is the one who is ready to dirty his hands, to torture, to do horrible things. But in, towards the end, he is no longer dead. He gets totally desperate. He says, everything must come open. I cannot live with it. And his positive opposite, Alison Taylor, the more liberal president, also gets entangled in a deadlock, has to step down. So what I like is that there is no, as we put it, bullshitting. The, the series ends up with a radical deadlock. Within present coordinates, it's simply practically impossible to find an ethical position. Isn't this a much more sobering lecture than, you know, that feel-good liberalism and so on and so on? That's the spirit we need today. Don't go into this blackmail like you will bring us, you are bringing us only the bad news. No, the good, the good news are, I claim, I hope we again agree here, uh, Stanley. The go good news should be like things like uh, dignity or whatever, which are so-called, they are necessary, necessary byproducts. If you directly aim at them, it's counterproductive, you know. If you try to act with dignity, it's ridiculous. It must emerge spontaneously. For, so I claim that if there is a hope today, it, it can only emerge as a necessary byproduct of our pessimistic analysis. It's not that you, you paint it directly. So, okay, after this stuff, let's go to work. Okay. <laughs> uh, I would like to begin with a wonderful quote from my, maybe known to some of you, I'm sorry, of my preferred theologist, Gilbert Keith Chesterton, who, in his novel, The Man Who Was Thursday, uh, ironically proposed to install a, quote, special corps of policemen, policemen who are also philosophers. Here is a quote from Chesterton. The work of the philosophical policeman is at once bolder and more subtle than that of the ordinary detective. The ordinary detective goes to coffee houses to arrest thieves. We go to artistic tea parties to detect pessimists. The ordinary detective discovers from a diary that a crime has been committed. We discover from a book of sonnets that a crime will be committed, and so on and so on. Now, this may appear ridiculous, but would thinkers as different as Karl Popper, Theodor Adorno, Emmanuel Levinas, 
not subscribe to a slightly changed version of this idea, where actual political crime is called totalitarianism and the philosophical crime is condensed in the notion of totality. A straight road leads from the philosophy's philosophical notion of totality to political totalitarianism, so these guys claim. And so the task of political, sorry, philosophical police is to discover from a book of Plato's dialogues or a treaty on social contract by Rousseau that a political crime like Gulag, whatever, will be committed. As we said it when I was young, from Plato to NATO, to NATO <laughs> line. The ordinary political policeman goes to secret organizations to arrest revolutionaries. The philosophical policeman goes to philosophical symposia to detect proponents of totality, and so on and so on. It's nice, provocative idea, this idea by Chesterton, but I think at one crucial point he is nonetheless wrong. We philosophers, at our best at least, when we are truly philosophers, we don't try to destroy the system. We just observe and bring out signs, features, which demonstrate that the system is undermining its own premises, undercutting itself. This is why, permit me a brief detour through Hegel, this is why I like Hegel's notion of totality. It has nothing to do in Hegel, this notion with this kind of a theological, large, encompassing, sorry, encompassing unity. You know, like, this may appear to you something horrible, but if you look from it all, oh, it's just part of the divine harmony and so on. No, for Hegel, to locate a phenomenon into its totality does not mean to see the hidden harmony of the whole, but to include into a system all its distortions, antagonisms, inconsistencies, and so on and so on. This is for Hegel totality. For example, to make a quick jump to today's global politics. To observe capitalism as a totality doesn't mean that I should be, uh, uh, be uh, uh, telling you some nice fables about global market, bringing peace, prosperity, democracy, but to include into capitalism also <coughs> sorry, phenomena, for example, like Congo. Take Congo, which is probably the hell on earth today. A country where, according to Time Magazine report a couple of years ago, five million people died in the last years for unnatural reasons. Uh, a state which even doesn't function as a state. Look at it closely and you will see it's not some kind of uh, uh, Joseph Conrad heart of darkness out of our civilization. As such, it's fully included in global capitalism. Most of the metals, some, I mean, most of some components of our computers which make them workable come from Congo and so on and so on. So, to put it in more philosophical terms, thinking begins for Hegel when uh, the distortion of a notion, like you have a certain notion, capitalism, democracy, and things are not well, so you say, no, they didn't apply it correctly, it's a distortion. The distortion of a notion becomes a distortion constitutive of this notion itself. You demonstrate how something which appears to be just a result of misappli misapplication, incomplete realization of a project is a necessary constituent of this project. Again, back to Congo, the point is to demonstrate that it's not that some of us here in Scandinavia are happy to live in highly developed capitalism, others slowly will approach it. No, the point is that we here, Scandinavia and Congo, we are all part of the same uh, of the same totality. Uh, what does this mean, this brief methodological introduction? How can we disengage, or rather step, acquire a minimal distance towards ideology today? Because we are being told repeatedly ideology no longer exists and so on and so on. Uh, to 
to give you a good example of how ideology and technology can be deeply, almost inextricably mixed with each other, I would like to recall to you, maybe you've heard about it, a strange invention uh, which was developed by Pranav Mistri, an Indian who works at MIT Media Lab. He developed a wearable that you can wear, gestural interface, again called Six Sense, two years ago, I think. Allegedly, it works. I saw the presentation on TV and so on. What happens here? All you need is, the hardware you need is a small webcam which dangles from your neck, a pocket projector, and a mirror all connected wirelessly to a smartphone in your pocket. That's all you need. The way it works is that you, as the user, you begin to handle objects and making gestures. The camera recognizes and tracks your hand gestures and the physical objects using computer vision-based techniques. Then the software processes the video stream data, reading it as a series of instructions, and it retrieves the appropriate information, texts, images, and so on, from the internet. The device then projects this information onto any physical surface which is available there. Walls, physical objects, whatever. What does this mean? Here are some examples how it functions. Let's say in a bookstore, I pick up a book and just, I hold it in front of me. Immediately, I see projected onto the book's cover the latest reviews, ratings, and so on. Because again, the camera, uh, the camera uh, processes the image, the image is recognized, and then uh, 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 through the wireless connection, all the data are mobilized, they come back, they are projected. Or if I want to check the time, I only draw the circle on my left wrist, and the projector displays a clock on my right arm. Or when I hold my fingers at arm's length to form a square, the system recognizes this gesture as framing a scene, snaps a photo, and saves it. And you, so you see, you have this pseudo transparency. It's a magic universe, almost. And of course, bad sexist as I am, uh, I, from my, I admit it, male chauvinist perspective, I immediately imagined how such a device could transform sexual interaction. Like, <laughs> I look at the woman and the projector immediately, sorry, it immediately projected on her, her characteristics. No, easy to seduce, but likes Jess and Dostoevsky, good at fellatio, whatever you want. It's very practical. You just look at it, everything is not. Uh, uh, in this way, the entire world becomes a multi-touch surface, while the whole internet in the cloud, absent, is constantly mobilized to supply additional data. Pranav Mistri, the guy who invented this, emphasized the physical aspect of this interaction. Till now, internet and computers isolated the user from the surrounding environment. The archetypal internet user is a geek sitting alone in front of a screen, oblivious to the reality around him. With six cents, with this machines, I remain engaged in physical interaction with objects. The alternative, either physical reality or virtual screen world, is replaced by a direct interpenetration of the two. The projection of information directly onto the real objects with which I interact creates an almost magical, mystifying effect. Things appear to continuously reveal or rather emanate their own interpretation. Paradoxically, this means that the latest technological ideas bring us back to the pre-modern universe in which meaning resides in things themselves. The gap between reality and meaning, the defining feature of modernity, is undone. This is why 
Sixth sense does not simply represent a radical break with our everyday experience. Rather, it openly stages what was always the case. And that's what I want to insist on. What shocked me with this invention is that at its most magic, it just brings out what we are all the time doing. Just replace the computer with the big stock of our ideological prejudices and so on and so on. To return to the consciously politically incorrect bad taste example that I gave, forget about all this technology. If I am, I hope I'm not, who knows. Uh, if I am this kind of a male chauvinist sexist, isn't this effectively happening when I look at an attractive woman? Would she like to do this? Does she like that music or whatever? Or uh, to give you maybe a clearer example, isn't it that racism functions exactly like that? You see a person and the, as it were, ideological illusion of racism is that, of course, not in a literal projection, but in a projection which is all the more brutal, you see there all your ideological prejudices. For example, if you are anti-Semitic and the guy is a Jew and just innocently smiles, you see in this smile all the cunningness. Why is he friendly to me? What does he want from me? Money? Does he want to cheat? You know, <coughs> so again, what I like here, this is typical of the practice of ideology, is how the more the experience is immediate, and you can celebrate this like that guy Pranav Mistri does as the end of this alienating Cartesian, Descartes is one of the bad guys that I like, you know, universe. I mean, he's good here to be blamed for everything. Al Gore even blamed Descartes in one of his earlier books for, for all the catastrophes of ecology. No, because instead of this, uh, how should I call it, uh, 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 harmonious, uh, 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 interpenetration between our universe and reality, we get a radical gap between our world of meaning and reality out there, and so on and so on. What we get here is an apparent return to pre-modernity, but nonetheless, which in a way is not simply to be condemned, because I think what is nice in this example is that it's not that it's a fake. Now, a traditional uh, reactionary would have said, no, this is a technological fake. It's no longer a true, a true authentic, pre-modern universe. I claim, yes, it is a fake, but it is a fake which retroactively makes also the pre-modern experience something which was a fake. Like, to give you an, a problematic example, uh, this is, I also think, the catastrophe with so-called virtual sex. It's not that now we have virtual sex once there was real sex. The problem with virtual sex is that in some sense you discover that sex always already was virtual. What do I mean by this? You know the popular definition of masturbation, which is you do it to yourself but with an imagined partner. Jacques Lacan, my favorite dogmatic point of reference, once made a wonderful remark claiming that if masturbation is, a, is sex with an imagined partner, you're in reality alone. What if real sex has the structure of a masturbation with a real partner? That is to say, the partner is there, but not as, in, with all Judeo-Christian theological weight, not as the neighbor, the abyss of another person but just as a kind of a prop to enable you to stage your fantasies. You are really with your fantasies here. In this sense, what if our standard sexuality always is structured as masturbation with a real partner? That is to say, you do not really relate to the other as other. You just use the real other as a prop to stage your <coughs> to stage your fantasies you remain within yourself and don't be shocked here i'm a good guy here very traditional i believe in love i'm not claiming all sex in this i claim precisely a very simple romantic if you want thesis in love 
you do reach out to the other. Which is why love is not, as it is usually a mistake, love is not idealizing. In love, you do not idealize your partner. In love is the magic moment when you are able to assume all the imperfections of your partner. But nonetheless, all the magic remains there. Okay, let's not get lost in this uh, <laughs> melodramatic point. But tell you that I claim that, so when people talk about postmodern, post-secular world, and so on, this invention by Prana of mystery is something which comes pretty close to it. That we have a kind of a return to pre-modernity, but let's call it technologically reconstructed pre-modernity, which, which uh, again renders this fake inextricability between the universe of meaning and our perception of reality. How to break out of it? The only way, I think, is what in structuralism we call the differential approach. Differentiality in the sense that what matters is not only what you see, but what you don't see or don't say. What is absent is, as Hegel would have put it, a determinate absence. It's constitutive of what is here. To give you an example, my God, the most classical one. You know which are from Silver Blaze, one of the Sherlock Holmes stories, the best known lines from Sherlock Holmes. When, uh, Sharon Holmes asked an inspector, do you remember the strange accident with the dog the last night? The other guy says, but the dog did nothing. This was the strange incident, no? What does this mean? <coughs> Where is ideology here? Let me give you a wonderful, let me tell you a wonderful dialectical joke from Ernst Lubitsch's film Ninochka. In just, it's just a small short scene where the hero visits a cafeteria and orders coffee without cream. And it's wonderful what the waiter replies. Maybe you know it, I'm sorry. Waiter replies, sorry, but we have run out of cream. We only have milk. So can I bring you coffee without milk, <laughs> not coffee without cream? It's deeply true. Although. You will say, but uh, uh, the guest gets exactly the same. No, it's not the same thing to get coffee without milk or coffee without cream. Here, okay, I'm sorry, I don't have time to go deeply into the theory of what is implied here. Because uh, why do we add cream or milk to coffee? Because coffee in itself, as every commodity, is not enough. You know, as we say, every commodity has to have a certain magic, like, no, as they put it, coke, that's it. And that it, it's like when you fall in love with a woman, you never can say what it is, no? I mean, that's elementary of love. If you can say, I love her because of her legs, eyes, then you're already a mental accountant, you know, like, <laughs> that girl has nice legs, eyes, that one has beautiful breasts, that one talks, and then you say, okay, this one has four or five features, this one wins, I love you, no? <laughs> it doesn't, it must be an X. And this X, as a rule, I'm so sad we can, don't have time to go into this, the mystery of love is that this X should be a misperception, uh, sorry, should be a, a, a weakness, a failure, an imperfection. Uh, I remember some, when, when were they still in my youth? My God, time passes. Some 20 years ago, they were the ultra models, uh, 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 Sidney Crawford and Claudia Schiffer. And I read a simple, stupid text about how people relate to the two of them. And the result was that a large majority would prefer to live with Cindy Crawford, Cindy Crawford, sorry. And when they were asked why, the answer was, you remember she had a small mole here. They say the other, too much anxiety, she is too perfect. You need, you need, you need a small uh, imperfection. And incidentally, I'm so sad we don't have time to go into this, because this is the problem with love today. If we will have time, I will go a little bit more into it. In our narcissistic era, did you notice how love or fanatical sexual engagement are themselves becoming transgressive? Now you will say, I'm bullshitting. Ah, let me give you a couple of examples. <laughs> did you see the last James Bond film, Quantum of Solace? 
politically quite progressive. To cut a long story short, James Bond uh, uh, saves the Morales regime in Bolivia from some reactionary company. But did you notice something else? It's the first James Bond where at the end you don't have the sexual act between Bond and Bond girl. In all others you have. Now you will say this is one example. Ah, let's go to the lowest of the lowest of the lowest, which means Dan Brown. Did you notice how in uh, Da Vinci Code you have Robert Langdon and the grand, 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 grand daughter of uh, uh, Jesus Christ? <laughs> Did you notice no sex? And I even claim that this is why poor Jesus Christ himself has to be engaged in sex up there, to mask, cover up the fact that there is no sex here, you know. <laughs> Like, this is a very nice reading of X-Files that a friend of mine, the British Lacanian uh, Darian leader, proposed. You know, X-Files, all the time something happening from outer aliens. Why? To cover up the fact that nothing happens here between the two of them, <laughs> no? All these poor aliens have to bang on our doors, no? Uh, so what I'm saying here is that, okay, that's Da Vinci Code. Then, one of the big candidates for the worst novel of all times, uh, The Lost Symbol. There is not even erotic tension there, nothing. Now, things become mysterious. Let's go to Angels and Demons. There is sex there in the novel, between Robert Langdon and Vittoria Vettred, but not in the film. Where are we in the good old days of manipulative capitalism? Uh, Hollywood, as we say, was adding sex to make things more attractive. Now Hollywood is deleting sex. I am tempted to link this to another phenomenon which my good friend Alain Badiou, he drew my attention to it. Namely, he read one of these, uh, uh, in a French daily newspaper, uh, uh, one of these ads for, uh, for uh, dating and marriage agencies, which goes like this. It works also in English, because for falling in love, tombe, we use the same word, to fall. It says something very precise. It says, we will enable you to be, se trouve, to find yourself in love without the fall. <laughs> Sans tombe. And that's the point. In our narcissistic, this is why we liked all these agencies. And effectively, I think we are gradually, in a limited way, but nonetheless, returning to this pre-modern tradition of arranged marriages or dates. But uh, OK, it's no longer the relatives, but the specialists who do it. The idea is the following one. I mean, falling in love is something Terrible, let's admit it. You have a good, normal life. You, you drink uh, in the evenings with friends, maybe a one night stand here and there. Everything is perfect. Then, let's say you really passionately, with all sexual passion, fall in love. Your life is totally ruined. Everything <laughs> turns around it and so on. Which is why I read this today. I was shocked. This morning, I flew from New York on United, and you know, United, their journalist hemispheres. I open it and it said there, we are outsourcing uh, work and so on. They forgot to add torture and so on, what we are outsourcing. <laughs> and then they claim, isn't it time for an active businessman or woman today to outsource love life? And it's the same idea, like, we will organize all for you. Uh, I think it's too cheap to talk here about alienation and so on. The basic idea, I claim, is that we more and more fear this very openness exposure to the other. You know, the, this moment of vulnerability, which, let's be brutal, as you, uh, Walter kindly mentions this class struggle versus multiculturalism, no? This moment which I detect in the topic of harassment. Harassment is, I think, one of ideological categories today. I don't mean this in any ominous Stalinist sense. I mean ideology in the sense that you take a problem which is a real problem, but the way you formulate a problem mystifies it. Like harassment, of course it describes a very real problem, and I'm totally for harsh punishment, whatever you want, sexism, racism, and so on. But unfortunately, harassment tends to mean something more. It's, uh, 
even its opposite, I claim. Namely, ask yourself the Wittgensteinian question, not what does it mean, but how does it work in our language games and so on. Isn't it that we tend to use the word harassment when, in whatever way, the other as a desiring being becomes too intrusive, comes too close to us? For example, a typical French, I know matter the situation here in France, racist, today is a liberal, he would never admit he is a racist. He would say, oh, I love blacks, their, their, their music, beautiful, but, and then comes the but. Usually in France they say, uh, I don't like the smell of their food, I find this intrusive. Or it can be, I think, the classical topic on which Spike Lee plays nicely. In his, how it's called, his early movie, To Do the Right Thing, it's music, no? Blacks are okay, but in these boom boxes, their music annoys me, and so on. Or the way they smell, the way they laugh, and so on, and so on. And again, what makes me afraid in this topic of harassment is that hidden in it is the opposite of what we don't, it wants to be. Don't harass me means don't come too close to me. So. Insofar as we read tolerance as no harassment, it means precisely I don't tolerate, tolerate your, your over proximity. Okay, but back to coffee, where we began. So we have this coffee and it's always missing the key ingredient, the mystical one. It's like, you know, in a woman, that's something which makes you fall in love. And I claim that, uh, that this is why we add things to coffee, because coffee is not coffee in itself. It's a little bit like, at some point in California, it was even prohibited to import them. They had to be smuggled from Canada, namely, do you remember, now you can get them, I hope, so-called Kinder Surprise Egg. You know, just an empty egg shell, like, like egg, and then within a small plastic toy. I like this because it's kind of a metaphor for perfect commodity. It's a commodity chocolate, but it's as if they are telling you, we know what's your dream. In commodity, there is something more. Well, here you have it, this stupid plastic toy. <laughs> here you have it. The true mystery of commodity, I claim, is what? Now you will tell me, of course, but some, but what about those purists who like coffee, just plain coffee? Ah, I came, coffee can be its own supplement. How? If you know the history of cinema, there is a wonderful example from André Bazin, the French great theorist of cinema, who said, you know, in the late 40s, Western, the movies, the movie genre uh, uh, found itself more and more in crisis. And as you probably know, the first reaction was to, to, to combine it with another genre to obfuscate this crisis. Like, you know, Seven Brides from Seven, whatever, it's Western with musical. Then even a very good one, like Raoul Welsh Pursuit with Robert Mitchum, Western with film noir. Then the problem comes, what about two films a from a couple of years later, mid-50s, two mega-Westerns? Uh, Shane and High Noon. André Bazin proposes, proposes a wonderful theory. These are meta, these are Westerns, but where this meta dimension is Western itself. It's a Western which, as it well, relates to itself as its own uh, higher level uh, norm. So let me go on. What am I aiming here with this negation and so on, uh, like, negation inscribed into the very identity. Ah, I can give you another wonderful erotic, I claim, example. Don't be afraid, very modest. <laughs> it's from the old English working class drama Brust Off with, with, uh, with uh, Ian, uh, Ivan, sorry, Ivan McGregor before he became Jedi when he was still a working class hero. <laughs> there is in the middle of the film a wonderful scene where the hero accompanies a young pretty woman home, they are flirting, then at the entrance she tells him, would you like to come up to my flat for a coffee? He answers, yes, gladly, but there is a problem, I don't drink coffee. Her answer with a smile, no problem, I don't have any. <laughs> you see, nothing is said, just something is offered and then taken back. But the result is not zero, 
The result is an almost embarrassing, obscen obscenely open invitation, uh, invitation to sex. Why lose time with this type of jokes? Because I claim they offer maybe one of the keys as to how ideology functions in our allegedly post-ideological times. Today, ideology is not so much in what is directly said, but you must locate, let's call it the determinate absence, what is not said but implied. You must find you are getting coffee, ideological coffee, but the true question is, am I getting coffee without milk or without cream? No? What is there? For example, there is already, I cannot restrain from doing it, because I think that one of the great spiritual catastrophes implied by the fall of communist regimes is the, the disappearance of wonderfully uh, refined, sometimes political jokes. No? Exactly the same paradox, you find it in a well-known joke from socialist Poland, where, you know, things were always not unavailable usually in the stores. So, a guy enters a store and asks, you probably don't have butter, no? The, the answer, sorry, no, no, you are, we are the store which doesn't have toilet paper, not butter. <laughs> the other store there is the one which doesn't have butter, and so on, no? So, again... It's always this question, you know, in Brazil, they told me we are a wonderful nation. Uh, when there is a carnival, all people dance together. Yeah, I told them, but you know, there is a poor worker who goes to carnival uh, and dances there just to forget that he cannot properly provide for his family. And there is a rich guy who goes there to dance so that he feels one with the people or whatever. No, like... You know what I mean, one is dancing without coffee, the other, sorry, without milk, the, the, the other one is dancing without, uh, uh, without cream. Or to put it yet in another way, uh, uh, let's take the, again this brushed off example. I think we can well imagine a similar dialogue where uh, the charming seductive girl is, uh, is Dick Cheney from two, late 2002 when the United States were preparing the invasion of Iraq. Let's say Cheney went to Europe to convince Europeans to join them in attacking Iraq. And he told them, would you care to join us in the attack on Iraq to find weapons of mass destruction? European replies trying to squeeze out, no? Uh, but you are better equipped. We don't, we, have, we don't have proper facilities to search for weapons of mass destruction. And probably Dick Cheney answered something like, no problem, there are no weapons of mass <laughs> destruction in Iraq. You know what I mean by this? That, uh, let's be clear, uh, I'm not saying, here I support Julian Assange, but in a very specific way. What he did is not simply to bring everything out from the most personal level to international level of interstate relations. No, no, one has to be refined. You cannot simply say everything. It's an obscenity already at the interpersonal level. Even Kant, who is the philosopher, who is the fanatic of say everything, never lie, concedes that there are situations where you are obliged to lie. And he, in a very nice way, gives as an example, for example, you have a friend who is mortally ill of cancer, no? You will not tell him, oh my God, you look like shit, when will you drop down? You will tell him, of course, oh, you look a little bit better, I'm so glad to see you, whatever, no? So the, po the point is what? That uh, when you say something like this, a lie or not saying everything, the problem is in what, what do you imply? Here, I think we should refer to, a, again, wonderful scene from a Bra Marx Brothers movie, which is otherwise not so good, one of the late ones, uh, Go West, where at the very beginning, if you remember, uh, Groucho, yes, it's Groucho, Groucho Marx enters a train station and there at the, how do you call it, office, whatever, wants to buy a ticket, and then he gives to the, he gives to the selling per salesperson there a, a whole bunch of dollar notes and says, it's okay, don't count it, and so on. No? The, the guy nonetheless counts them and says, but it's not enough. 
And Groucho says, well, I told you not to count it, no, and so on. You see, he said, don't count it, but with the implication, don't bother, everything is okay, no? Can't we again use the unfortunate Dick Cheney and claim that, you know, he said in an interview, I forgot to which uh, public medium, that let's be frank, he was, of course, referring to torture and so on, let's be frank, to really fight the war on terror, some things ca has, have to be done discreetly. Let's not talk about it, something like that, no? But then we discovered what was included. We thought, okay, a little bit of hard pressure and so on, no? But then we discovered that there were many other things included in this, like him privileging Halliburton and other companies and so on. We can well imagine him telling us, okay, okay, some things have to be done discreetly, don't look into them, let's not look into them. Then we would tell him, but wait a minute, we have here your own private interests, uh, Halliburton, and he would say, but I told you we shouldn't talk about it, and so on. You see, this, uh, this type of, uh, how should I put it, uh, uh, this type of gap is crucial in today's ideology. Maybe the crucial dimension is not, the lying is not so much lying about what you say, but lying about the implications. You manipulate at the level of generating the wrong implications. Permit me another example from cinema that I often like to use, maybe you already know it, I'm sorry again. One of the true, I claim, masterpieces of Hollywood left John Carpenter's They Live, a very naive, from 88. It's a wonderfully naive story of an unemployed guy called John Nada, Nada, nothing in Spanish, so proletarian, whatever you want, who, homeless, jobless, wanders around LA and enters an abandoned church and finds there some glasses, some glasses, mysterious. Then he walks around the city, puts them on, and discovers that these are literally critique of ideology glasses. Like, you put them on and you see the true message. For example, he sees a big poster, go to Hawaii, have the holiday of your lifetime, and so on. He puts the glasses on and it says, enjoy stupid enjoyment, don't think, and so on, but like, the true message. Uh, now, you will say, this is simplistic, stupid. Ah, it's not so stupid, I'll immediately tell you why. The movie is nonetheless more intelligent than it may appear. The first thing I like is that, uh, uh, is that to see the truth, the true message, you have to put glasses on. This is already a good beginning because our common sense would have tell us when we don't see things clearly, we have some glasses which distort. You have to do is to take the glasses off and see things the way they are. No, 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 you need glasses, which means, to put it, sorry, in half Stalinist terms, you need education. Truth doesn't come spontaneously. I think we have to accept this pessimist message, which is why in a wonderfully ambiguous scene of the film, when the hero tries to bring his best friend to put the glasses on, the friend resists, and there is a very strange fight which goes on for 10 minutes. I mean, the function is precisely this difficult message that uh, freedom doesn't come for free. Another thing that I like here is that the movie turns around the standard ideological gap. In the standard ideological gap, it's the true message ideological that you get directly. And as it were, what you see implicitly for what you have to put the glasses on to see it directly. What is only implied is precisely the ideological enjoyment that which, with which ideology bribes you, as it were, no? So I've written three books celebrating Christianity, so don't take this wrongly, but nonetheless, I have just some problems with this Catholic pedophilia, the shameless way they treat it. And I would say, let me imagine in the same way you see a poster, dedicate your life to God, become a priest, then 
What would you have seen putting on glasses? And you can have the small boys if you do it discreetly and so on. Or let me do it a more brutal racist example. Imagine, of course, they didn't function like that, but imagine we, we are in the 20s in the south of the United States, Ku Klux Klan and so on. Okay, you see a poster like defend our Christian way of life and so on, whatever. You put the glasses on and you read, and if you do this, Next weekend, we can go and lynch some blacks and <laughs> rape some black girls or whatever. I mean, this is an extreme, I don't have time to go into it, but this is an extremely important lecture, I think, which already was understood by Theodor Adorno of Frankfurt School and by others that totalitarianism is not simply terror renunciation. It always also bribes you with some kind of a false transgression. Like, this was a wonderful discovery for me when I learned that Mikhail Bakhtin, maybe you heard about him, he's the Russian fellow traveler of, the, uh, of formalists who, in his book from mid-30s, the, uh, the work of Francois Rabelais celebrated this carnival culture, you know, the magic moment when explicit rules are suspended, beggar is king, king is beggar, and all my leftist friends are ecstatic, oh my god, it's like utopia. Unfortunately, a friend of mine, a Russian theorist of art, Boris Groys, told me that now they discovered the archives of Mikhail Bakhtin, who was exiled to Kazan, a small city, and it's absolutely clear that Far from celebrating Carnival, his book on Rabelais, it's a kind of a coded theory of Stalinist purges. The real Carnival were the Stalinist purges, where precisely today you are the king, member of Politburo, tomorrow you are in Gulag, the English spy traitor or whatever, no? And uh, all of Stalinism played wonderfully with this coded way, wonderfully, wonderfully in a terrified way. For example, my favorite story of this codification is that Molotov, at some point the second, third guy after Stalin, got into total panic at some point. How? Uh, you know, when there was the big political trials, the, it was very important to read closely what the accused were accused of. Because you get, this is the Kremlinological, symbolically, but much more interesting than Robert Langdon, no? Uh, because many things you can learn. For example, when there was the, I don't know the trial against whom, I think this was already late Stalin, the Jewish plot, so-called, no? Uh, uh, the idea was that the doctors were part of the imperialist plot to kill Soviet leaders. And they were enumerated them. Stalin, Molotov, and so on and so on. Then a week later, Pravda, wrote that now the investigation came to new results and again this list of victims, the ones who, whom the plotters tried to kill was printed and Molotov got into a panic because his name was not there. This meant he is not in, you know, because his name was not, I mean, it's a crazy universe, I admit it. So let me go on, not to lose time. So again, uh, what I find interesting in this glasses theory is that uh, uh, it doesn't follow this traditional way where, again, you get explicitly the direct ideological call, uh, 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 sacrifice yourself, whatever, and with glasses on you see the obscenity, small boys uh, raping blacks, whatever that you get. It's the other way around. The direct message is the obscenity is pleasure, whatever. The implicit message is the injunction which, which sustains it. Uh, and I think that this brings me back to the beginning. It would be very interesting, I claim, maybe, to just imagine when you are not sure about certain humanitarian uh, ad or whatever, imagine you putting glasses on and imagine what can one read there? For example, my classical example, you see an ad with the, the disgusting manipulation, the, the, the disfigured face of a black young boy, and then the message, something like, for the price of a couple of cappuccinos, you can make a difference, you can save his life. Okay, fine, let's put the glasses on. Isn't it something 
We know there is big injustice in the world, but for a price of a couple of cappuccinos, you can not only not care about it, but even feel good that you really did something or whatever. That's the whole point, I claim. It's the same as with, now I will be very brutal, you will not like it probably. Let's take all this ecological bullshit. No, I, again, I, ecology is the problem today. But what is bullshit is how it is ideologically rephrased through this lifestyle ecology, you know. To trying to make you feel guilty. Did you recycle that can of Coke and so on? Which is, or let's go even further. Uh, let's take organic apples. You buy them. I also do. But do you ever ask yourself, why do you buy them? I claim that the majority of us don't really believe that they are any better than those beautiful genetically manipulated <laughs> apples. It's more that we are buying ideology for, by paying more. It makes us feel good. Isn't it wonderful? Even when I buy apples, I'm part of a big project to save the Mother Earth. I'm doing something and so on and so on. It's a wonderful way of pseudo-activity. You know, pseudo-activity in this sense of my friend Austrian philosopher Robert Faller drew attention to these paradoxes of magical thinking today. You know how the most stupid example. You sit at home, at TV, you watch your favorite basketball, baseball, whatever you want, club fate, and you shout there, oh, go on, go on. Of course, you don't believe it, but nonetheless, you act as if your shouting can magically influence the game. I claim when you buy organic apples, you do something quite similar to this, frankly, no? I mean, again, I'm not saying we shouldn't do it. I'm saying, let's just be aware that when we are doing it, we are also doing it to forget about what is really to be done. And again, I'm sorry if I repeat an old example, but I like to repeat it. Here, the ultra example is Starbucks. I think they should be awarded a kind of a Nobel Prize, not for economy, but for, for, for literature, or if there would be Nobel, Nobel Prize for thought or what. <laughs> you know why? Because they did something quite ingenious. In the dark old days of ordinary capitalism, we were consumerists. Then we felt bad for being consumerists and you had to do something against it, no? Whatever, dedicate your life to uh, big humanitarian causes, do something, whatever. But at least there was a gap. What is Starbucks doing? I love them. I love them, which means I would bomb them, but cannot, no? <laughs> uh, uh, you remember all the posters you get when you enter Starbucks coffee house, no? Like, uh, our, basically the message is, our cappuccino is more expensive, true, than with the others, but 1% goes to Guatemala children, the other to, I don't know, bring, war to, uh, bring water, sorry, to the, the <laughs> desert, whatever. Isn't this a wonderful thing? The message is, you don't have to stop being a consumerist because the price of redemption, anti-consumerist price for solidarity, we include it in the price of a commodity, you know. So it's included, you can go on and you can feel well and so on and so on. Okay, so now we have a problem. The problem is, oh my God, I will kill myself. Okay, uh, I, okay, now I will do something, I will, don't be in a panic, I will stop shortly. What I only want to do is to play this game. Let's say it's the end and the debate begins and I ask myself a question, what did you want to say in the remaining part of your talk? I will be brief, okay. First, unfortunately, I didn't have time. I wanted really to develop just an idea of what is going on today, the basic idea was already proposed by some economists that the role of being unemployed is changing today radically. It's not, not just the old uh, Marxist notion of reserve army of labor. The system is more than ever systematically producing large number of people who all of a sudden became basically for life unemployable or even worse the big crisis in Europe with students. They are educated, but it's in advance clear there will be no job for them, uh, so that we have radically to expand, change the notion of exploitation, 
connected to this, I wanted to develop how uh, I don't like with all the discourse analysis and so on, this uh, notion of, you know, how we always like to focus on domination, how we are dominated, regulated, and so on. I claim that domination without exploitation becomes something all too uh, ideological for me. It obfuscates the basic capitalist paradox and so on. So. Uh, then I wanted to do something which I hope that you, I don't know why, I felt that it should be Stanley in your spirit, no? To show up how to obfuscate all this stuff, ideology functions, for example, uh, uh, my, one of the guys that I really like, uh, 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 Jean-Pierre Dupuy, the French uh, theorist of catastrophes and so on, has shown how contingency and injustice of capitalism. This is how ideology works at its best, best, I mean most efficient. Far from being an obstacle to the functioning of capitalism is what makes capitalism palpable. And he gives this very simple example of, for example, injustice. I work hard, you were lazy, but because of some irrational, unexpected market movements, I go bankrupt, you succeed. This is what makes capitalism tolerable. From what point? From the point of resentment and envy. Because in this way, I can retain my fake dignity. I can tell to myself, oh, that guy is a jerk, blah, blah, but that's capitalism, it's all contingent, and so on. It would have been much more difficult and dangerous to have a society where the success of people would have been really determined by their actual achievements, merits, and so on. Because if then you are a loser, then you are really a loser. No way to claim, you know, it's, it would lead to much harsher, uh, uh, which is why I'm deeply suspicious of the idea of intolerance. I don't know why I associated this idea with your, in good sense, evil spirits, you know, sorry. The next uh, thing I wanted to develop against the same line is that I'm sick and tired of this religious idea, even on Wall Street you can see it, oh, against greed and so on. Don't blame it on psychology. If anything, capitalism at its purest, it's not a point of egotism and so on. True evil is not egotism. Here I wanted to develop a wonderful theory of uh, Rousseau, where he says that egotism is not evil. It's very easy, in contrast to what theologists are saying, to pass from your egotist concern to the common good. With a little bit of reasoning, you get it. Uh, 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 evil begins when and this is the famous Rousseau distinction between amour de soi, love of the self which is natural, and amour propre, the perverted preferring of oneself to others. Uh, amour propre is not simply I want my own profit, but, you know, as they say about capitalism, it's not enough for me to win, the other has to lose. And that matters more than me winning. The logic is the one which is maybe constitutive of my nation, because one of the uh, proverbial attitudes of a Slovene farmer is, you know, a fairy comes to him and tells him, would you like for me to give you a cow for free? But I warn you, warn you, I will give to your neighbor two cows. He said, no, rather kill one of my cows, but kill two of the neighbor. You know, like, <laughs> the, the, all this. Uh, 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 in other words, my point was that uh, we cannot criticize Capitalism in the sense of, oh, it's greed. No, capitalism, Walter Benjamin, there are other Walters, unfortunately, uh, 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 was right. Capitalism has the structure, it's a perverted religious ethics. Capitalism says expansion, self-reproduction of the capital must go on no matter what the utilitarian human costs and so on and so on. So you don't need any any mega ethics, you can criticize capitalism precisely from a simple utilitarian standpoint and so on. Which now brings me to my conclusion, now that we live in these times of turmoil and so on, what would have been, I don't have 
the right to give any advice, but nonetheless, I will do it. No? Uh, precisely, the first attitude would be don't blame people in their attitudes. The problem is not corruption or greed. The problem is the system which pushes you to be corrupt. I'm here a kind of a Brechtian, uh, not cynic, but, I, you know, Bertolt Brecht, I don't like him too much, but at some point what I like in him is this implicit, very Protestant theology which emphasizes the fall of man. His idea is you can change man, man is by nature evil and so on, and there is a wonderful dialogue of those Herr Coiner, Mr. Coiner stories, where a guy says people are manipulated by media, by newspapers, we have to change people so that they will not fall for this manipulation. And Herr Coiner, Mr. Coiner, the good guy, Brechtian hero, says, no, people are the way they are, you can only change newspapers. The his revolution change newspapers, not people. No? In the same, sorry, the same goes here. The second thing that I think should be emphasized is that this moment here is a dangerous one. You know my old joke, how the system is offering us more and more a product without its, uh, without its how should I put it, uh, dangerous uh, ingredients. Coffee without caffeine, ice cream without fat, beer without alcohol, and so on. The danger is that this protest will also turn into a, and incidentally, that's my problem with multiculturalism, the, the official one. The other, it celebrates, it's a decaffeinated other. This shitty other with uh, holistic attitudes and so on. My cure against it was, years ago, when I was in Missoula, Montana, I encountered a Native American Indian. He gave me the lesson of a lifetime. First, he said, I hate the name Native Americans. What does it mean? You are cultural Americans, we are native or what? And he told me, I prefer to be called Indian. You know what he gave me as the reason? He said, because at least then, my name is a monument to the stupidity of white men, you know, <laughs> who thought they are, you know. Then he said, I hate this patronizing attitude, you know, oh, you have the holistic attitude towards nature. And he told me, I can give you books which demonstrate that we have burned more forests and killed more buffaloes than you ever will do, white men, and so on. <laughs> this is true anti-racism, not that patronizing ideal, uh, idealization. So again, what I'm saying is that at this point, we should resist, they're easy to resist. Direct enemies who say, you know, oh, lazy guys uh, who do nothing, they destroy property, American values. To them, it's, I claim, pretty easy to answer, like property. My God, I already said this on Wall Street, maybe you know it. When Demonstrators are reproached for destroying private property. Listen, the, the, the 2008 crisis, if by property we mean what even Tea Party people mean, not some financial speculations, but real hardworking people earning their houses, then 2008 destroyed more private property than all the left united if we were just destroying property and so on. So uh, the other thing uh, that, you know, we are in what sense in a fragile moment? And here I'm not bullshitting. I'm precisely not saying, oh, the first moment of a communist revolution. I'm not crazy. I mean, <laughs> communism in the, in the 20th century sense is over. It was a catastrophe. Even uh, I'm claiming that the only thing that remains of communism are the problems, problems of commons, nature, and so on. Communists are well and alive today. They are willing. They are today, as you know, when they are in power, the most efficient capitalists, no? When I was in China, I read a wonderful commentary where they say 40 years ago, Deng Xiaoping thought only capitalism can save China. Now, in a crisis, we behave as if only China can save capitalism, not? <laughs> and there is a very serious problem here which is that the marriage between capitalism and democracy seems to be over. What is really emerging in China, Singapore, and spreading around is a capitalism more efficient, dynamic, productive, destructive than ours, but which fits perfectly an authoritarian uh, regime. So what I'm saying is that what I like about these protests is 
the fact that a certain taboo is broken. To go back to my beginning, it's no longer just we have to get rid of corrupted people or whatever. It's allowed to think that there is maybe something wrong with the system as such. But that's it. Let's be clear. We, at least, we don't have the answers, which is why we should absolutely resist that kind of a blackmail, which I call clinching blackmail. You know what is clinching in boxing, I think. You don't want to be beaten, so you embrace the enemy. The biggest practitioner of clinching is, I think, Bill Clinton. You know, here is his reaction to Wall Street. He said, protests are on balance a positive thing, but he said, I quote him, they, protesters, need to be for something specific, not just against something. Because if you are just against something, someone else will fill the vacuum you create. So then he said, uh, support Obama's plan for concrete measures. But I claim this precisely is what we should resist today. Not because there are some ominous plans to destroy this. A certain dissatisfaction emerged. And let's use it as a, as it were, zero level starting point to start thinking. Where no one has the privilege to pretend to have any answers. I am absolutely not saying that we intellectuals know. Although it's incredible what a demand there is on this. I mean, there are people, as you probably know better than me, who don't take me seriously, but nonetheless, I got many messages where people told me, Professor, could you write us a precise program? What should we do next week? I don't know. I mean, uh, so we intellectuals don't know. Those who have programs are bluffing or are like Clinton, and I'm not saying he is immoral. He just, what does it mean what he says? You know, if you are a woman, you know how this works when you are in so-called, which are, I think, very subversive things, hysterical outbursts. You do hysterical outbursts, and then a man says, but what do you want, really? This what do you want is very oppressive. It really means compelling you to translate your rage or whatever into the form of a demand which is already part of the hegemonic system and so on and so on. Uh, so uh, uh, I think that precisely we should resist this. We should simply start thinking without illusions. We don't know, but also we should avoid this kind of pseudo-Maoist fascination Trust the people, they know it. No, people also don't know it. Nobody knows. We don't know, people don't know. We maybe know what's the problem. And here, the metaphor I like is that of Claude Levi Strauss, who said something, said something wonderful about the prohibition of incest. That it's not a problem, but an answer to a question that we don't know what's the question. And maybe, this would maybe be the formula of what we should do. We should look at the protests as reactions, answers to a question which we should formulate maybe. We cannot provide answers, maybe we can ask the right questions. And through this interaction, something may emerge. Why? Because to conclude, just the last lines, they're maybe even known to some of you, I've already published them. You know, the immediate reply would have been, but are you dreaming? Is the change possible? And so on and so on. Uh, what is possible, what is impossible today, you may have noticed it is an extremely ideologically invested matter. Did you notice how, on the one hand, concerning technology and private pleasures, more and more everything is possible? No? Like, you know, the media are telling us, my God, I read on the 10th of October in Pittsburgh, it's pretty terrifying, did you read it? It's the first time that the guy, a crippled guy, already learned how to move his hand just by the power of his thoughts. They implanted some, uh, uh, some, some, some stuff here, which is not even uh, invasive, penetrative, but just reads the signals, and after practicing for a month, he can move objects, just by uh, thinking about it. 
Now, this is nice, but it has its dangers because our most elementary sense of freedom is my thinking is here, reality is out there. What happens with, uh, to our subjectivity and so on? I'm not a catastrophist. I'm just saying we have to think. There are problems today, ecology, biogenetics, and so on. We have to start thinking. The only way in which I am a communist, if you want, is only in the sense that the problems we are dealing with are the problems of commons. Ecology, our commons. Biogenetics, our commons, and so on. I'm not saying, oh, return to Leninist party, which is uh, 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 ridiculous. But what I want to say is that, okay, in the domain of technology and then through, through uh, cloning, we can become practically immortal, always new organs, all these goes, and all the obscenities that I like to tell here, like I was told I cannot resist saying it. In New York, there is now a surgeon who specializes in cutting a penis into two. You can do it with two. Whatever. Okay. All this is possible. But did you notice how then, but when you say, let's spend half a percent more money for healthcare, impossible. We will become incompetitive, whatever, and so on. Uh, this is the sad thing for me. How we can, as Fred Jameson put it, your guest also here, we can imagine the end of the world being in Montreal or whatever. We cannot imagine spending a little bit more on healthcare or whatever. No? Here, and it's not a priori impossible. Are we aware to what extent even today's capitalism functions on certain ideological prejudices? For example, recently I was in Norway and friends told me that there and it's not any socialist terror of social democratic government. It's simply part of their social pact, shared national consensus, that in an average private also company, the gap between the lowest paid cleaning man or lady and the top CEO is one to four, maximum one to five. And again, it's not some state regulation. It's simply people somehow accept it. So what I'm saying is that this is the problem, as again Fred put it nicely. We can imagine the end of the world, we cannot imagine a small change in capitalism. So really now the conclusion, in mid-April of this year, something wonderful happened in China. I love this accident. The government, it's not a joke, I checked it with my friends there, because it sounded too crazy to be true, but it is. The government issued a regulation prohibiting in all narrative media, that is to say, cinema, TV, TV stories, uh, comics, novels, literature, all topics concerning uh, alternate reality and time travel. The official explanation was that it's too serious a matter, history, the great history of Chinese people, to be left to such stupid play. Of course, the fear is it's not good to allow to the people to even imagine alternate possibilities. But I think this is a good sign for China. You know why? Because at least people still obviously imagine it, so they need censorship. The tragedy of us is that we don't even need this censorship. We already cannot imagine it. So maybe, maybe this is the stuff of us intellectuals. We are not magicians. We don't know what to do, my God. But what we can do is just to use all these demonstrations, etc., to, as it were, open up the space for thinking, to widen the scope of what is considered possible, or even what is considered impossible. Because I hope you, Stanley, would also like, we, we both share a certain, now we will all, both be linked for this, dogmatic Stalinist spirit. What do I mean by this? For example, when people say democracy, blah, blah, blah. No, in certain things, I like total dogmaticism. Where? Let's take rape. I wouldn't like to live in a society where you freely debate rape. No, sorry to tell you. I would like to live in a society where the idea that rape is something horrible, inadmissible, is totally dogmatically accepted so it's not even a matter of debate. If somebody advocates rape, 
You don't have to, you know, if you debate it, you already make the Reagan mistake. You know what I mean by Reagan mistake? Reagan, this was a wonderful moment 30 years ago, 20 years ago. I remember President Reagan was once accused that he is close to those, some people who advocate, who deny the Holocaust, no? And his defense was a legendary one. It was, no, it's not true. Whenever at my dinner someone denies Holocaust, I always fight him. Of course, the question is, what kind of friends does he have <laughs> that he has all the time to, 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 to defend that there was a Holocaust? So what I'm saying is that uh, at this level of what is considered possible, impossible, maybe it's our duty to change. Like, maybe we will not be, at least not in this easy way, immortal, but maybe we can change social regulations a little bit, no? Because, you know, again, to conclude with my standard line, remember, the true utopia is not to change things. Unfortunately, the true utopia is that the way they are, things can go on indefinitely. This is the true utopia, which is why we, who, without any communist dreams, new party or whatever, we who just want to open up the space of questioning a little bit. We are the true anti-utopians. I'm sorry if I was too long, but at least you maybe understand now why my friends call me Fidel. Not because of <laughs> politics, but you know, Fidel comes, comrades, just 10 minutes of remark, and then if he is very tired, it's three hours. No, <laughs> thanks very much for your patience. Thank you. Now, uh, Walter, yeah. if you want to become part of our Stalinist club, <laughs> yeah. I hope you did your duty and distribute questions yeah. so that there actually, will be an appearance of free debates, but you know. Slavo did actually give me a question, it planted a question, but, I, but I'm not, it was only to be used if no one else had questions. Yeah. I'm up here just to say there are microphones on either side of the room. And what we thought we'd do is just have people line up with the microphones and then go back and forth from one to the other. Um, so I'm going to wait for a second to give people a chance to get to the microphones. Um, and if no one is at the microphone, then I will have to ask the extremely obscene question um, that I was planted with, and I won't do it. So just give it a second. I don't know what game are you playing now. Do I'm not. Really I'm not. I'm not playing. Here. Do you really want Where, to ask? No, me? I don't. I'm done. Uh, here. And then you are laughing, and you don't even have the question. <laughs> Sorry, please. Yes, it please. was about a dog. Just, I hope it works uh, yeah. so with sound. You just go there and there, and I'll let you. Go. No, no, but no. the mic. I hope it works. No. No, it doesn't. Okay. It does. It, it does. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. It does. Um, one of the premises of critical thinking, of course, it's reflexivity, and it's yeah. the awareness of the conditions yeah. of possibility yeah. of. And when you talk about this incredibly charming, and of course, I'm, I'm enthusiastic about it in a. Mm -hmm. more in a political sense than in, a, in an epistemological one, this idea of putting the lenses and kind of seeing the truth. Yeah. I mean, there's a fiction of transparency that we as intellectuals are able to unveil yeah. the reality. But of course, we have to be aware of our own standpoint when we do that. So I don't know, I'm, I'm very curious about that idea of the sort of standpoint. We don't have the, the answers, which I think it's, it's something that, yeah. that I appreciated yeah. uh, listening to you saying yeah. that at, at the last part. But this idea that there's a move of unveiling and there's an assumption that there's some hidden truth out there that we're going to be able ah. to find. And how do you reconcile that as a standpoint of being an intellectual with the reflexivity mm. of actually being aware mm. of, the, of their own conditions it's and very relative conditions? Wonderful question. Again, the only problem is that it's, as you admit it, it's a one hour answer question. Okay, very you briefly. Give me a short answer. Very <laughs> briefly. My answer would have been that the truth to which we do have access is not a positive truth in the sense of I magically step out of myself and see the things the way they really are. What we can see is the inherent untruth of what is going on. What do I mean by this? A wonderful example that I really liked. Uh, for example, uh, Jacques Lacan says somewhere something which has a male chauvinist twist. I don't like that. But if you take the form of it, it's wonderfully true. He says, 
Let's take a husband who is pathologically jealous about his wife sleeping with other men. And he says, even if all his suspicions are true, the, the wife is really doing it, his jealousy is still pathological. And in this sense, you know, I'm not saying compare it with truth. I would like to apply this to racism. For example, I already did it in one of my books, to anti-Semitism. Let's say we are in the 30s, late 30s in Germany. I am a Nazi, you are not a Nazi. We debate the role of the Jews. The moment we formulate it as, let's compare racist prejudices with the Jews the way they really are, if you are the anti-Nazi, you so sell your soul to the devil. Because the true problem is not that of abstract truth in the sense of are Jews really like that. Once you debate about this, you come to some kind of a stupid mixed result. Jews uh, uh, exploited the Germans. Well, in some vulgar sense, this was up to a point true because purely formal sense, because some Jews definitely were rich. And, you know, or, I don't know, Jews were seducing and corrupting German girls. Well, I hope they did. As every <laughs> you know what I mean? That's not the problem. The problem is not, is it true? The problem is, why did the Nazis, in order to sustain the consistency of their ideological project, why did they need the figure of the Jew? And at this level, you can tell the truth. It's an immanent truth. It's a truth of, of what pushes you to say what you say. It's not the objective truth. In this sense, I believe this is the truth that critique of ideology can bring out. It's not objective theory of society independently of a standpoint. I'm sad that I cannot develop it, but quite on the contrary. What already Hegel knew, and what we should keep from Marx, is that universality and partisanship, in the sense of taking sides, are not mutually exclusive. To go even further, and that's a great ethical idea, I claim, that truth is partial and doesn't lose, because of this paradoxically, its universality. In other words, when you have a complex situation of struggle, the right position is not, oh, you are claiming this, you are claiming that, I will step back and look for it from it objectively and see truth is somewhere in the middle. No, in a radical struggle, one part, even if it's formally a minority, stands for the truth. For example, again, back to Germany, you cannot say, uh, Jews were right, but they exaggerated a little bit. Hitler was a little bit right, so somewhere in the middle. No, Hitler was a lie, even if, maybe, I'm not saying definitely not most of it, even if, if you prove me that some minor things that he claimed he said about Jews are literally true, it's still a total lie. So again, I'm not, when I criticize ideology, I'm not talking about some kind of objective truth independent of engagement. Truth is for me a category of an engaged partial category. Partial, but nonetheless universal. Okay, I cannot go, I would love to, but. Uh, uh, you are now opportunist oscillating between left and right, no? I, it's noticed, please. Uh, this, is a, this is a question in honor of uh, the sadly recently deceased media theorist, uh, Friedrich Gittler. Yeah. Uh, you were mentioning the sixth sense uh, technology. Yeah. And to me, you, you seem to describe it as though uh, this technology is somehow mapped with certain, certain ideological, like almost mapped by its ideological environment. I was wondering if you, had, if you could think of an example where perhaps it's in fact the, the media that generates ideology, that, that maybe the causality might be reversed. Uh, there, uh, now you caught me here. I don't like to bluff. Yeah, sorry. You caught me here. I don't want to bluff too much, but from what I know, I think it is clear that it's not so much that there is ideology, but that, for example, uh, if you take cinema, isn't it clear there were detailed historical analyses demonstrating how 
the whole idea of camera, cinema registration, the way we have it, presupposes the typically modern notion of perspective reality and so on, which is by no means natural. Or to go even further, isn't it clear that what happened with this privatization of listening to music, where listening to music is no longer a public experience, but more and more you alone, isn't this also a clear case of technology causing, although, some, uh, co causing, although you know, I'm here try to be more open in the sense that uh, I, I'm not sure I would totally agree here with Hitler, although, I mean, he, has, he had also, he wasn't alone. He had some pupils who were doing an excellent job. And you must know the irony how they were referred to. Hitler Jugend, you know. Like, <laughs> cannot resist saying it. But what I want to say is that, nonetheless, I claim that the relationship is one of mutual influence. I don't believe that you can isolate some purely technological mechanism which, can, which is the zero level and then maybe it's retroactively influenced by ideology. But no, if anything, I claim that ideology has a priority, that there is no zero level technology which does not already materialize a certain set of uh, ideological presuppositions. But of course, here ideology is not the traditional ideology. I mean, in this sense of a world view, blah, blah, blah. What interests me much more is this, let's call it in Michel Foucault, Foucaultian way, micro ideology, you know, as I did in that stupid passage, which everyone is quoting, but I'm horrified by it from the beginning of uh, Plague of Fantasies, the structure of toilets, American, European, German. You know, no, I find this, I will not tell you this story, you all know it, but what interests me is this ideology, you know, an apparently just disgusting private ritual, sitting, going to toilet. You see, we are there already in ideology. But so again, this would have been maybe my prejudice, that I don't, not against Hitler, but because it's more unclear how he means, but against this simplistic reading of technological inventions generating ideology. I think that technological inventions are rather open and even if an ideology was at work in how they were conceived, they can escape this control of ideology and so on. So again, uh, I, I would just render the things more complex here. Sorry, I don't have a more intelligent answer here. Okay. Um, thanks. Uh, I guess my question is, uh, you talked about the, the financial crisis and also simultaneously a crisis of imagination. Yeah. So first part of the question is, what would, what would it take for that to change? And sort of alternatively, um, why don't you start a Leninist party? Sorry, why don't I? Why don't you start a Leninist party? <laughs> like if it's absurd. Uh, yeah. This is, I think that unfortunately, although it's much more complex, uh, now, I will do a little bit of self-propaganda. The big answer will be the book that I've just finished uh, on Hegel, where I try to do the return from Marx to Hegel. And uh, this book, it's a modest, short book. It will have just 1,200 printed pages, so it's <laughs> madness. But there, I try to point in what sense Marx, and especially Lenin, are, in a way, more idealists than Hegel. Marx and Lenin imply something which for Hegel is totally prohibited and unthinkable. The idea that a determinate historical agent like working class of party can get to know the general tendency of history, it can be put in a more crude way, we are realizing historical necessity, or in a more subtle way like in the young Lukacs and so on, but nonetheless can kind of a get to know the general tendency of history and then act as an agent based on this knowledge. This is for me what is too much already in Marx, especially in Lenin. Now, I'm not saying uh, that we should simply go back to some kind of abstract decisionism, you don't know what you are doing, and so on and so on. But certainly, I find problematic this idea of 
leg legitimizing your activity by direct historical knowledge so that you can say, I know where things are moving, I'm the agent of this change. If Hegel's idea of list der Vernunft, cunning of reason, has any meaning, it is precisely that whenever you do this, things do these things always get wrong. This is why, incidentally, I'm also absolutely for Hegel's idea of cunning of reason. It's not a primitive teleological idea, we do what we do, but some mysterious reason steers us, controls us. It's on the contrary. The cunning of reason means basically when you plan something, one thing is sure, it will for sure go wrong, like that there will be an, another result out of it. So again, uh, 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 this is my basic, my, this is my basic problem. Although Lenin, again, is here more ambiguous, even Lenin, but nonetheless, the basic idea of the avant-garde party is this one. And I think that, uh, again, without celebrating the spontaneism of the working class, I'm not saying against Lenin that we should... Uh, trust the ordinary people. No, nobody knows, neither the party no, nor the people. But from there, in, but their gap should be maintained. Like, I always deeply distrust those who celebrate the wisdom of the ordinary people. These are usually the true elitists, because, you know, the trick is that when you celebrate the wisdom of the ordinary people, it always usually means that you are the one who speaks for them who knows better than themselves. There is a wonderful line in Orson Welles, you all know it, Citizen Kane. You remember, in the middle of the film, Kane is accused by a conservative banker who comes to visit him, like, it's horrible, you try to please the crowd, you evoke the lowest instincts of the poor, you speak for them, for the rebel. And you must remember uh, uh, Kane's, Orson Welles' answer, it is, Yes, I speak for the poor, ordinary people, but are you aware that if I don't speak for them, they may start to speak for themselves, no? And that will be the, the truly dangerous moment, no? <coughs> Sorry. So again, don't you think that one of the problems of 20th century was precisely that this idea went, uh, went uh, triumphantly wrong? I still think the beginning of the October Revolution was an incredible emancipatory moment. I absolutely insist on it. But on the other hand, unfortunately, I cannot buy the simplistic narrative of some of my Trotskyite friends that you know. Oh, if only Lenin were to survive three years more, made a pact with Trotsky, then we would have a wonderful, thriving socialist democracy. It was an authentic tragedy. I mean, maybe it wasn't inevitable, but we can see logically how it became Stalinism, but nonetheless, we should not, this doesn't take anything away from the greatness of the origins. You know what I mean? It's an authentic tragedy. In contrast to Nazism, there is no tragedy like that. Nazis were be, to put it in naive terms, very bad people who said, if we take power, we will do some bad things, and what a miracle, when they did take power, they did these bad things, no? <laughs> you don't have this, which is why in fascism, especially Nazism, you don't have dissidents. You, I mean, nobody reproached Hitler of, maybe Heidegger, at some crazy, <laughs> some crazy, of betraying the inner essence of uh, Nazism or whatever, no? Again, this is, but I agree with you, this is a very complex topic, and maybe I exaggerated a little bit too much. I'm not an irrational decisionist. I'm not saying we know nothing, we should just act or whatever. No, we need knowledge more than ever. You know who is my hero here? Maybe you know the story, I excuse myself, of this false identity with ordinary people. Terry Eagleton told me what happened 30 years ago when the great Marxist historian Eric Hobsbawm gave, it was fashionable at that point, gave a talk to ordinary workers in a factory and to 
to kiss the rest, how to put it to become, uh, uh, started in this you know, way of, uh, listen, I don't know anything basically more than you. It's not only that I'm teaching you here, I'm here to learn uh, uh, from you, you know, playing this solidarity with the people. And then a miracle happened. One ordinary worker stood up and said, literally, fuck off, you are bullshitting, you know. <laughs> You are educated, paid to know. You should teach us what you know. Don't give us this bullshit. You know, this is the only honest attitude. This means not patronizing ordinary people. No? So again, I'm not saying we know nothing. We know many things we should. Just, uh, you know, this knowledge does not have this strong, predictive, let's call it performative form. There is a gap. Sorry, again, I didn't answer, but uh uh, that's life, no? <laughs> so, let's do, let's do, let's do. Leave one more here and then we'll. So, then we'll... okay, a well, question here. So, you remember. Um, uh, Are you Russian like me, Slavic? No, I didn't say Slavic. I said, you remember uh, yeah. that. Sorry. No, because of the accent, yeah. Uh, that who Lenin called youthful idiots. Yeah. So Russian, so Putin organized a channel in the United States called Russia Today, yeah. where all kind of youthful idiots describe how United States doing very poorly. In the same time, he already 12 hours uh, in power put some kind of puppet president and supposed to be president of yeah. Russia for life, yeah. like a mm, yeah. tsar something. Yeah. How would you comment this uh, kind of um, event of transfer from socialism, communism, mm -hmm. so-called, to capitalism? What, uh, no, uh, maybe my answer will surprise you. First, let me make it absolutely clear. I have no sympathy whatsoever for Putin. I visited once Russia two, three years ago, and I didn't know who invited me. It was that guy called Gleb something. Who, Pavlovsky, Gleb yeah, Pavlovsky. Yeah, who afterwards I learned, my God, this guy is Putin's PR man. But Pav he was fired now. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's a hope then. Oh, perfect. <laughs> okay. No. And this is why then I didn't want to visit Russia because I was afraid again of getting caught into some kind of game like that. But you know, what makes me really sad, it's relatively easy to explain how it came out the way it came out. I don't think the, the truly sad thing is that, uh, okay, maybe not Putin. The sad thing about Putin regime for me, and although it was, the situation was different, it started already under Yeltsin, is that uh, the tragedy of Russia, I think, is that the way they passed to capitalism is to open up the field for the most non-productive capitalism. You privatize banks, national resources, sorry, uh, natural resources, like the Chinese did it in a much more intelligent way. They started with small companies producing for, for a consumerist market, private, you know, where you were able to slowly see how it works and nonetheless Ordinary people felt some, right, in Russia, this is for me the tragedy. The whole structure remained inefficient. All that, if I simplify it, happened was that some guys monopolized uh, natural resources, banks were privatized, it's horrible. And here I'm almost paranoia claiming maybe all the advice given to Russians by American economists were not so innocent. Maybe they said, oh, maybe we should help Russia a little bit to remain weak, you know. But uh, you know what uh, really made me sad when some of my friends were in Russia? How, even if there is still very little, I know, but some kind of freedom, you can criticize a little bit Putin, but aren't people more or less resigned already, no? People, more and more, I was told, especially intellectuals, they really, they accepted it. It's horrible, but it's fate. Probably nothing will change. It will go on like that. And I'm just, I'm just very sad for Russia at this level. I don't know what could happen. No, it's uh, a certain 
do you maybe you have this is what I meant interrupting yeah. you sorry that sure they we are yeah they resigned in sense that they don't believe that it's legal way to change this regime yeah any illegal way what happens mm -hmm. it could not be predicted they, they everybody predicts this in two years and 20 yeah, years yeah, yeah, but yeah. it's all not yeah. un, hard to analyze but, di but didn't this already start this finish season for example i don't have again any illusions about khrushchev but one thing was interesting wasn't khrushchev the last moment of the communist regime when even if it all was a cynical fake there was some kind of belief, you know, we will maybe overtake you. You know, believe in, we are doing something that may succeed. That they overcome America in yeah, 1980. Yeah. Well, isn't it that with Brezhnev the game was over? Not even nomenclatura, nobody believed in it. So this confirms my tragic experience in my country with how more and more, this is my personal experience in ex-Yugoslavia in the last 20 years. It wasn't only that the ideology was cynical in the sense of people didn't take it seriously. You were prohibited to take it seriously. I had two friends who worked in central committee or some cultural commission, whatever, and they really believed in Yugoslav self-management socialism. They lost their job because the nomenclatura thought that like, you know, sincerely believing in official ideology meant the first step towards dissidence. So, and I, I'm sorry, again, we don't have time. I have wonderful, un Slovenia was a small country where everybody knew everybody went. So when, as a young student, I was once there when general secretary of the party gave a speech where he says, you young communists should not only do theory, you should also follow the fourth thesis of Feuerbach. Philosophers have only interpreted uh, the world, we have to change it. Then afterwards, I approached him and said, please, comrade secretary, if you will repeat this speech, be careful. It's the 11th thesis, you know. <laughs> you know what his answer? I know it, but that was my message. I don't care. You know, him there, he, in a nice way, and this is what really fascinates me. This is more and more, I'm sorry if I will conclude with an old joke of mine, how ideology functions today. It not only doesn't matter if you believe it, you actively should not. Like, I'm sorry if I repeat this for the 10th time, but it's perfect. You know that Niels Bohr story, you know, he was visited by a friend in the countryside. The friend saw a horseshoe, superstitious item in Europe. Now, if you put horseshoe above the entrance to a house, evil spirits will not enter it. And he asks Niels Bohr, my God, are you crazy? Aren't you a scientist? Do you really believe in this superstition? And Bohr gave him a perfect answer. He says, of course I don't believe in it, I'm a scientist. But I have it there because I was told that it works even if you don't believe in it, no? <laughs> this is ideology today. We don't have to believe it, we just practice ideology, no? So thank you, but again, this would be a wonderful debate, no? Because I think, but let's agree in one thing. Don't you agree that the political jokes from communist countries were a great spiritual legacy which unfortunately disappeared now. Of course, but they will appear with jokes about Putin now. Yeah, but aren't they just a pale repetition of the true greatness of jokes yeah. on Stalin, <laughs> unfortunately? <laughs> Thank you. Ah, now I want to... So that people will not hear me, the, the, the dirty things. Um, you are all in